Our reading this morning is from Jonathan Ellerby and is entitled Trauma and the Spiritual Path. When I first became interested in the connection between spirituality and trauma recovery, I found that many people in mainstream health and healing programs felt that spirituality was a bit too much for someone just trying to get by. In other cases, there was an assumption that spirituality and religion are the same, and that religion was really not a necessary element of treatment. These were encounters of a healing model that placed spirituality at the end of the line, certainly not at the beginning. The philosophy behind the resistance to spirituality was, look after the basics first, then progress towards more complex issues. While this is the natural tendency for many people in daily life, it is rarely the best approach to any kind of growth. As a trained counselor, chaplain, and practitioner of a number of complementary therapies, it has been my consistent experience that spirituality is best placed as a starting point for most people dealing with trauma. Spirituality can be the foundation of healing, and more and more programs today accept and embrace this reality. Over the last 14 years, I've been honored to have worked with many great healers, teachers, therapists, and trauma survivors to witness the power of spirituality in healing. My first experience of the critical role of spirituality in healing came while I was being mentored by a Native American therapist who was also a community spiritual leader. I recall the day I watched and listened as he ran an on-reservation training program for a group of Native American trauma counselors. After a day together, it was clear that most of the trauma workers were survivors themselves, witnesses of violent deaths, survivors of abuses, accidents and injuries of all kinds, and losses of multiple family members. The wise healer talked about the importance of remembering the essence of what it means to be human, the essence of what it means to be a unique person. He reminded us that within each person there is a spirit, a spark of life, an essential self, so independent of the world's biases, attacks, and influences that nothing can ever hurt or destroy it. There is more to each one of us than the things that have happened to us. When we are hurt, we can identify with the pain or the trauma, but a healthy spiritual practice or perspective teaches us that we are something greater. The essence of the spiritual life is to stay connected to the sacred place within, that holds the memory of wholeness, peace, and balance for us, no matter how far our hearts or minds may be pulled. Most spiritual practices also connect people with a sense of community and support. These both are essential elements in the face of trauma and loss. When we build community around our spirituality, we have a place to bring our hurt where together we give each other permission to be vulnerable and we challenge each other to learn and grow. The spiritual journey helps us to shift our perspective from why me to what can I do about. We learn to shift our attention from what is wrong to what can I be grateful for. This experience of empowerment connects us to the awareness that every one of us has the ability to help. Everyone is a healer. Again, that was Jonathan Ellerby. Last week in the sermon on healing the body, I spoke of the role the mind plays in our health. Medical science seems to be showing that our brains, our attitudes, our belief in various therapies can play a role in our healing. We can't fix everything with positive thinking, but putting our intellects and emotions into play can improve physical outcomes. It helps 
when we work with our medical treatments. But what happens when our spirit is damaged or broken? How do we find healing for that? Well, you discussed that some amongst yourselves already. We need not look far to find examples of what can be called spiritual brokenness. The Me Too campaign that exploded after a number of Hollywood accusations about sexual abuse suggests that a lot of people, especially women, have been carrying the spiritual effects of harm for a very long time. The truth and reconciliation process in this country and the hot mess of the missing and murdered women's um, inquiry are lifting up the spiritual brokenness and unfeeling society inflicted on an entire people over the last 150 years. Child abuse, bullying, war trauma, first responder trauma, all of these can break a spirit. And if you're paying attention to that list, you probably had the letters PTSD pop into your brain. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a topic these days. At first, many categorized it as merely a mental disorder in the early days. It was treated by professionals usually with the letters psych in front of their job title. But increasingly, it is recognized as trauma done to the spirit. One author described it this way, PTSD is not primarily a disorder of the mind, though it may appear as such but rather a disorder of the heart that no longer feels capable of dealing with the helplessness that it had no way of preventing. This helplessness, while in a state of moderate intensity, can produce a numbing of all the emotions of heart and body so that one can just live through the experience. So the question is, how do we come back from that kind of a trauma? Is medicine the answer? Well, perhaps not, or at least not exclusively. As Jonathan Ellerby suggested in our reading, as a trained counselor, chaplain, and practitioner of a number of complementary therapies, it has been my consistent experience that spirituality is best placed at the starting point for most people dealing with trauma. Spirituality can be the foundation of the healing And more and more programs today accept and embrace this reality. His suggestion is that healing from trauma or PTSD is more likely to happen when the whole person is served and dealt with and and healed, not just focused on an unhealthy mind. And it becomes more challenging when the illness strikes that part of us that will not show up on an x-ray, a blood test, or an MRI. Spirit might be the glue that holds the whole thing together. And that has to be addressed in its own way. Have you ever noticed heart, spirit, gut? We have metaphors describing this intuitive feeling side of us. The parts of us that are not easily located anywhere in our bodies, but which nevertheless can be damaged or broken. And we seem to need to locate them somewhere in the body. However you choose to describe it, there is a piece of us that is beyond normal medical description. But I like the image of spirit as the the kind of altogether piece. The word comes from Latin, as I'm sure many of you know, and it means breath. That's it, just breath. When the spirit is broken, it is like having the wind knocked out of you. But for a very long time. Look at the concepts we use to describe losing your breath for a short term. Catch your breath. Take a deep breath now. Breathe in slowly. Breathe out slowly. In and out. In and out. Why? Because the first thing we have to do in that crisis is to restore life-giving oxygen without which our bodies fail pretty quickly. But in addition to replenishing oxygen levels, these techniques offer something else. They are tools for restoring calm, for finding groundedness. 
the blood stops rushing in our ears. Our muscles begin to relax. There is a reduction of stress and a rediscovery of balance in our lives. And then once equilibrium is regained, well, then we can move on again. The challenge of a damaged or broken spirit is that the journey back to that long-term equilibrium can be a difficult and slow one. And chemical medicine seldom offers the complete answer. Increasingly, as you heard, the treatment of PTSD is making use of spiritual care as part of the interdisciplinary mix, along with things like art therapy and its various therapeutic cousins, to help sufferers through the dark tunnels back to greater wholeness and balance again. Even, and I love discovering this, even the American Veterans Affairs Department has a section on their website devoted to the value of spirituality. They write, Aspects of spirituality are associated with positive outcomes, even when trauma survivors develop psychiatric difficulties such as PTSD or depression. Research also indicates that healthy spirituality is often associated with lower levels of symptoms and clinical problems in some trauma populations. For example, anger, rage, and a desire for revenge following trauma may be tempered by forgiveness, spiritual beliefs, or spiritual practices. Spiritual beliefs may uh, influence the trauma survivor's ability to make meaning out of the trauma experience. And in turn, the meaning drawing can have a significant impact on the survivor's symptoms and functioning. The VA article also suggests that issues of guilt often need a spiritual response. In war, for example, many soldiers wind up with values that come into conflict with one another. They've been taught in their homes or in their churches or wherever about generosity and forgiveness and loving your fellow person, and yet they are trained to do exactly the opposite things. And sometimes in the horrible moment of war, the conflict of those two things cause a break. Moral teachings of compassion and charity bump up against military training and patriotism. To use a more local example, Women may put into, be put into conflict by the pressure of gender and sexual stereotypes when faced with harassment or assault. On the one hand, they're exposed to norms that say they should be busy being attractive and sexual, and that could compete with moral messages around modesty, self-determination, the right to say no, the right to control their own bodies. When abuse occurs, many are afraid of coming forward, or even take to blaming themselves. And that's just not right. The VA concludes that introducing a positive concept of spirit can greatly affect treatment outcomes, not always, but often enough for it to be valuable. So how do we deal with a broken spirit? Well, a few moments ago we sang, gather the spirit, harvest the power. The hymn is another way of saying, Let's start by taking a deep breath. Reinvigorate your spiritus. Breathing in, gathering inspiration. In some ways, it really is technically a simple thing. It's impossibly hard to do, but it's technically very simple. I mean, if you look at Facebook, memes are filled with reminders about take a walk in nature, learn to appreciate simple things, enjoy a quiet quiet cup of coffee, a walk with a friend, a book, whatever it might be. And indeed, each of those things can be part of renewing the spirit. <clears throat> but if it's so easy, I wonder why it gets posted and reposted and reposted and shared and why they keep coming up so very often. Maybe it's because we miss our opportunities to breathe in thanks to all of the distractions that keep us running about and off balance. And I wonder how often each one of us hides from inspiration or ignores it or perhaps feel that our ability to be inspired is as blocked as a filled up sinus during cold weather. Let's be clear. The possibility for inspiration is always around us. 
just like the breeze, is part of the environment, just not always a part that we choose to notice. Its presence may be faint at times, but it's there. And the challenge is for us to see it for what it is and to welcome it in, to breathe it in. If we have a moral conflict, let heart and spirit guide us to the right decision. Follow your gut. But there are times when gathering the spirit is terribly difficult. Tired, feeling oppressed, beaten down, harassed by others, when work seems boring and unemployment so frightening, when physical or mental illness saps our ability and our resilience, steals away from us the chance to embrace life, when failure hovers around us like a cloud, then noticing the potential for inspiration eh, can seem almost impossible. And of course, there are those traumatic experiences of which I spoke that can break the strongest among us. But even these terrible events don't mean that the potential is not there. I, uh, I saw um, a memory come up a little while ago, uh, a story when the Syrian refugees were hitting the island of Lesbos in Greece, and um, a series of Greek performers showed up at the camps as clowns to play with the children. In the worst possible moments of their lives, these people were bringing joy and happiness to these little children who were playing around. Children know how to find the spirit again. It might just mean that we have to learn to trust enough to walk the spiritual path for as long as it takes. So sometimes gathering the spirit's easy. Every now and then the spiritual moment walks up, smacks us against the side of the head with such force that we cannot ignore it. To be at a birth or a death. To realize that you've fallen in love. Or maybe just that you've fallen in love again with the same person. These are moments of spiritual awakening. To stand on a mountaintop or a seashore and witness a sunrise or a sunset. To pause and drink in the silent and brooding forest. These are aha moments. I don't think I have to describe it. I expect pretty much everybody knows what it is to just go, have the breath almost forced into you. Those ahas can be heady stuff, but they're momentary. For those who are deeply damaged, the aha moment won't be enough, but it can be a good place to start. Jonathan Ellerby told a story in our reading of a First Nations healer. I recall the day I watched and I listened as he ran an on-reservation training program for a group of Native American trauma counselors. After a day together, it was clear that most of the trauma workers were survivors themselves. Witnesses of violent deaths, survivors of abuse, accidents and injuries of all kinds, and losses of multiple family members. The wise healer talked about the importance of remembering the essence of what it means to be human. He reminded us that within each person there is a spirit, a spark of life that is an essential self, so independent of the world's biases, attacks and influences, that nothing actually can ever hurt or fully destroy it. I disagree. I think it can be hurt, but I don't think it can be destroyed. I think we can find our way back. But the healing takes time. Finding the way back to the spirit is a long walk. It takes time and courage to share or let go of pain, often a very brave act in itself. None of us want to confront the darkness that sits inside us every day, nor should we try to do so. It has to happen some of the time, But in between active healing efforts, it's also important to put one foot in front of the other, just doing daily things. And this is really important for those of us who are walking with people who are trying to find their way to healing, because we want them to be healed, and kind of we want them to not be a problem for us anymore. So we take any sign that they're doing their job okay, or they smile again at work, and we go, oh, it's fixed, problem solved, I don't have to worry about it anymore. 
it's important to understand that it is a long, long journey. And that we need to walk with people and celebrate those days when things are going well and understand that it's not done yet. May never be done yet. But if we're truly loving and caring to those people, we will be there. Remember to call them once in a while when we haven't heard from them for a while. And just check in. They'll get the work done. They just need us to know that we're there. Healing the spirit requires balancing active healing therapy with self-care and self-protection from further shocks. So, yeah, you got to do the work, but you need to give yourself a break in between. It's kind of like when people have a really complicated physical problem and need multiple surgeries. Well, they don't do them all on one day. You got to heal up some before they can do the next one. Same thing with healing the spirit. Finding the balance in life is hard and it can take many tries. But the path to wholeness is there for those willing to walk. So the last word to Jonathan Ellerby again. The spiritual journey helps us to shift our perspective from why me to what can I do about it? We learn to shift our attention from what is wrong to what can I be grateful for? This experience of empowerment connects us to awareness that every one of us has the ability Not only to heal, but to help. Every one of us is the healer. Amen.